Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have John Miles White presenting Bandit Algorithms for the Web. John is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, Bandit Algorithms for Website Optimization. John is also the author of the best selling O'Reilly books, Machine Learning for Hackers and Machine Learning for Email. We're really excited to have John with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you folks get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for John. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for John, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is VelocityConf, all one word. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to John for his presentation. Hello, John. Hi, Yasmina. Thanks for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Hopefully, we'll enjoy the webcast. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this material, so I think it'll be really interesting to talk about. Um, so basically, what I want to talk about is the idea of using multi armed brain algorithms to try to optimize websites. Uh, and my sort of spiel for this is going to be thinking about it in terms of transitioning from something that many people do know about, which is A-B tests, and thinking about them as using a different approach, which I'll call M-A-B tests for multi-armed bandits. Um, I think this is sort of a really fascinating approach because in many ways, band algorithms are actually very simple algorithms, and we'll talk about them a lot through the rest of this webcast. And it depends that if you actually rat, sit down and write the code, the code is extremely brief. I mean, to make them sort of high scalable and things like that is sophisticated and takes some work, but just writing down the basic algorithm is usually never more than 10 lines of code. What's actually sort of subtle about these, and it's very different from other types of algorithms, is sort of understanding the applicability, understanding how they're going to work, especially relative to traditional A-B testing. And one of the reasons I'm going to emphasize that is because, in fact, A-B testing can be thought of as a type of multi-armed beta testing. So MAB testing, in some sense, is just a strict superset of AB testing. And so let's get started. So you know, the main question we all have to think about is the question of answering, how do we build better websites? Um, sorry, everyone. It seems like my uh, slide deck is slightly frozen. Um, there we go. Now it worked. All right. And so the question, as I was saying, is that we want to ask, how do we build better websites? And you know, growing up in New York, the sort of obvious thing that you think about is that it's like trying to get to Carnegie Hall. The way that you build a better website is that you just do testing and testing and testing and testing. And you know, that is sort of um, sorry. Oh, sorry, everyone. I can see that Yasmia is actually offering to advance his lives from this since it seems not to work. So please go ahead next. Um, as I said, testing, testing, testing. So next, so how do we build better tests in some sense? That's really what we want to think about. But before we get there, we want to ask ourselves, why is it that we run tests? What is the reason that A-B testing became so popular, and why is it that people might hope to move on and try to use multi-armed banded testing as a way to try to do slightly better than the A-B tests that are already running? Well, the reason we run tests in the first place is because we have lots of ideas. If we're at all creative, we can think of many different possible ways we could set up our website. 
And we can think about things like how do we run our email campaigns, how do we decide which logos we choose, how do we decide which type of landing page we have, do we people have do people sign in this way for da 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 da? There's many possible things we could think about. And we also have the idea that some of these ideas are better than others. And the question really becomes is how do we figure out which ones are better than the others? And so if we go on to the next slide, we have to think about this question, which is what happened if we had one standard logo? And for this example, I'll use the O'Reilly logo. And think about is this the best logo or could we do better if we moved on to the next slide and thought about what could possibly a different logo look like? And this is sort of a joke on the next slide, but you know, imagine having 2.0 added in. Everyone likes 2.0, and little, you know, it's a little small, so it doesn't make much of a difference, but maybe sort of subliminally it will make O'Reilly seem even better than it already is. And so the question is, how could we tell? Is this new logo better than the old logo, or is it actually much worse than the old logo? And my guess is that it's so small and such a subtle difference, it's probably not much of an important we still would like to be, be able to sort of precisely measure the difference between these two types of things. So if we move on to the next slide, we're going to start to talk about how we would do that. And the classical way we do this is with an A-B test. And I hope that this slide in some sense sort of subsumes what we vision as what an A-B test is and what we're hoping its success will be. And so this is a little sort of simple schematic graph. On the x-axis moving across, we have time. And so we're thinking about things where before we start A-B testing, what happens while we're doing A-B testing, and at the end, what happens after we're done with A-B testing. And we're testing two logos, logo one and logo two. And on the y-axis is CTR, the click-through rate. And this is for many types of things, the thing we would like to optimize on the website. So obviously there are other metrics one would like to optimize, but let's just start with this to have something simple and numeric. And for the rest of the algorithms we're going to talk about during this webcast, it's really important. Having things that are numeric makes the algorithms very precise and easy to state. In practice, this is a subtle point, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you do want to make sure that those numbers you choose and things like click rate are really what you want to optimize. Because it's always possible to make those numbers really large, but you're inflating them at the expense of other things you might care about. All of that said, this is usually how people view A-B testing. We have a period before A-B testing where we have our first logo, logo one. And then we enter an A-B testing period. And what happens here is that half of the people that we see get assigned to group A. And group A sees logo one. And half of the people we see get assigned to logo two. And they are in group B. And the result of that is that there's a click-through rate associated with logo one, which we can see in sort of very dark greenish line. And then the lighter greenish line is the click-through rate associated with logo two. And so during the A-B test period, what we get is the average of these two click-through rates, the 50-50 mix of having half of the people in group A see logo one and half of the people in group B see logo two. And this is really what we imagine most of the testing is like. We start testing something, it's a new idea, and it's better than we already have. And so we start seeing a comparison between the two groups for a while, until we realize, and that's when we end the A-B test, that we've actually decided logo two is the better logo. At that point, we move on, and we can see that the post-A-B testing click-through rate is reliably higher than the pre-A-B testing click-through rate. And along the way, we have a little period of exploration. And during that period of exploration, we were still doing better than our pre-A-B test. And so this is really the dream. This is what everyone hopes for when they run a web test. They start with some ideas that they traditionally had, they come up with some new idea, they put it into tests, and those tests are always at least as good as what they used to be, and sometimes they're better. And that's because the new idea is really a better idea. Eventually they realize that the better idea is the new one, and they fixate on it and remove the old idea. And so everything is better progressively across time. This is the ideal of A-B testing. But when we move on to the next slide, we'll see that this is not always what happens. And so the one possibility is that you run a test, and this schematic, what we see is there are two logos again, but now logo two, the new idea, is actually inferior to the first one. And so what happens is that before A-B testing, we have a pretty high click-through rate associated with logo one. Then during A-B testing, we have a 50-50 mix. Some people are seeing the old good idea, and some people are seeing the new bad idea. And so we drop, and that's what the brown line is, is the drop from mixing in some new inferior idea with our old traditional way of doing things. This is certainly not something we really want to wind up in. 
But eventually we realize that this was a mistake. Our new idea wasn't actually good, and we go back and revert everything to the way it was before. And so you see that in this graph. The post-AV testing period is one in which we have exactly the same performance as the pre-AV testing period. And this is obviously a thing we all worry about when we run tests. But of course, you have to run tests to decide whether we're in the first setting we saw before where things will get better, or in this setting where things are going to stay the same. If you take no risks, you'll never learn anything new. And in many ways, the idea of trying to do good tests is learning when to take risks and how to stop them and how to make sure that you're getting the most out of them. This is really, in some sense, the best case scenario of things going wrong during your risk. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see another scenario. And this is really the nightmare everyone has about A-B testing. And there are sort of a variety of nightmare scenarios like this, but this is arguably the worst of all possible ones. So here, before we start testing, we have our original logo one. It doesn't say 2.0, and so it's, it's got a pretty good close through rate. Then we have, at the post-AB testing, we're going to wind up using the newest logo, which has 2.0 on it, and it's a terrible and lowers our click-through rates. But what happens during the A-B testing period? And this graph may seem anomalous, but of course, people do have this experience. And so it's worth thinking about how is it that this happens? What sort of reasons could this sort of graph occur? And so what you can imagine here is that during A-B testing, you have a standard click-through rate. And it's associated with mixing some people into logo one and into logo two. But the standard one, which is what you expect to get, is some sort of mixture between the dark line, the dark blue line, and the light green line. Those sort of mixtures are what you would expect to get. But of course, there's randomness in when you actually happen. And the one thing you can imagine is that you happen to use your A-B testing all during Christmas for a commercial website. And so suddenly you're making a lot more sales and getting higher click-through rates on things simply because there's more traffic and more sales going on in your site. And so the A-B testing period in some sense is confounded with things that are going on in the world around you. It has nothing to do with what you chosen to test. You just got anomalous results. And so during the A-B testing period, things look great. They look like they've improved on your original logo one and maybe it's possible, and the implication from this graph is that somehow in this mixture, it's actually being attributed to logo two. And even though logo two's real value is a lower inferior light green line, pure noise, randomness, and other confounding factors mean that it happens to look good. And not only does it look good, it looks better than logo one. And so this is really the nightmare scenario. You enter this A-B testing period, you try out some new ideas, because of whatever random confounding things happen in the world, suddenly your new idea looks better than the old one, and you switch over to it. And in the post-AB per testing period, you fixate on some new option that, in fact, is inferior to the ones you started with. So the testing period was totally anomalous, not at all reflective of true conversion rates or too close to rates or too sales, and you now chose an option that is just strictly inferior to what you started with. This is really everyone's nightmare. So thinking about that, it's interesting to understand why is it that that might happen? And there's one really obvious case where that would happen, which is that you ran the test for far too little time, and so mostly what you got was just a variability attributed to other factors and not the logos themselves. So the question is, how could we make that not happen? How could we sort of slowly transition between logos? And that idea is what multi on banda testing is all about. So we'll move on to the next slide, and we'll have yet one more graph like this to try to illustrate our point. Now, on this next slide here, you can see that we've slowly moved between two logos and their rewards. And so in one period, the pre-MAB testing period, and now we're using a multi-unbanded algorithm, not an AB testing period, we have the original logo one click-through rate. And after it, we're going to have logo two's click-through rate. But mid-MAB testing period, what we're seeing is not a random mixture where we just get 50% people percent of people being in A and 50% of people being in B, but a progressive change slowly and smoothly between logo one and logo two. And what's happening here, and we'll talk much more about this as we go on, is that progressively during the period of MAB testing, we're realizing the logo two is better, and the more sure we become of that, we slowly move more and more people to see logo two. And so rather than having a whole period in which we're learning that logo two is better, but keep sending people back to the old inferior version, we're learning things and we're immediately deploying them. We're immediately taking advantage of them and slowly, incrementally, and smoothly moving people over into this new logo. So let's move on to the next slide and try to recap these ideas and think about what we're doing. 
So we want to have a new testing framework, and I'm hoping to convince people that multi arm banded testing is one possibility for a framework like that. And so it has some basic design requirements. One, we shouldn't keep testing bad ideas. And so while we're in the testing period, if we notice that something's inferior, we should be able to remove it. Once we're sure it's bad, we should get rid of it. And in our previous scenario, that's sort of like the second scenario. This is one in which we saw that something was inferior, and eventually we abandoned it. We'd like to make sure that the algorithm will always do that automatically. We don't want to have to step in and intervene to get rid of bad ideas. We'd like to keep that be totally automatic. There's another question, and this is how to fix the scenario that we saw on slide, in the third of those slides, which was how do we make sure that the tests don't end prematurely? And the definition here prematurely is quite simple. It's going to mean that we don't want to allow the tests to end while there's still total noise in the system. Well, we haven't actually really learned which logos are best, not because we're in some weird period like Christmas, but because we've actually really figured out which of them is genuinely the better one. And this is really the hardest thing people think about. And the reality is there isn't any quick and fast rule to solve it. In simple scenarios that we'll talk about, you can do some ways of solving it. You can think about things like power analysis. And there have been a bunch of people who have been recently talking about how to do power analysis for A-B testing. And basically what they offer you are apps that say, if you think this is the types of click to rates you can expect, this is how many people you need to assign to groups A and B during A-B testing before you can be sure that you should stop the test. And this is a great idea, but if done even slightly wrong, can have pretty disastrous consequences because of the way testing like this works. This is certainly not to discourage you from doing it. It's a wise idea to start from, but it's one that you need to be cautious with. But in the end, there are other reasons for caution that we can't really solve, and so we just sort of have to slightly put them aside and think about them later. And the reasons like, the period during which we're going to do testing is just anomalous. I mentioned this before with the Christmas example, and it's really worth repeating this and echoing it into your head. It's always possible that when you do the testing, something is going wrong, and you'll always wind up ending prematurely. The best thing you can do is to hope for a strategy that usually doesn't end prematurely. And the strategy we're going to use for that is the third of our design requirements. It was what that graph before of MAB testing was trying to get at, which is we want to make sure that the click-through rate slowly improves smoothly. And this is how we're going to try to help sure that things don't end prematurely, which is we're going to gradually, slowly let the test turn itself off. We're not going to require a human to intervene and turn it off. Rather, we're going to have the system figure that out for us. And so let's get started thinking about that. So we'll move on to the next slide and start thinking about algorithms that would let us have these design requirements. And that's where really the question is, how do we build better tests? So let's start talking about that. And the strategy is going to be simple. On the next slide, we're going to say, which is we're going to just use multi armed band algorithms. And I'd like to sort of spend a second before I actually describe any of the algorithms about what these things are. And so these are algorithms that come from a very long tradition of statistics starting in the 1930s, maybe even the 1920s, of people thinking about a couple of thought experiments. And the classic one, which is where the name comes from, has to do with the idea of gambling in a casino. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll talk about why the terms in a casino make sense. So on this slide, we have the jargon words we care about. So the first one, which is where this multi-armed bandit concept comes from, is the concept of an arm. And so you can imagine yourself in a casino that has lots of slot machines. And this is a metaphor for the, idea, the types of ideas we want to test. In our case, we've been using logos and imagine testing logo one and logo two. Each of these will now be called an arm. And so you can imagine that there's some bright slot machine that's green and there's sort of a darker slot machine that's brown and we want to figure out, well, which one of these would actually be for me to be playing better? Which one will I walk out of the casino at the end of the night with more money from? Each one of them is an arm. If you have a group of them together, it's called a bandit. And this is a sort of quirk of the way that people have talked about this, but the idea is that you have several different options you could try out. Each of them is an arm. If you have many of them, it's called a bandit. And specifically, it's called a multi-armed bandit. This is sort of just jargon you have to accept, um, but it is sort of evocative of the notions we care about. Um, and it certainly makes the next two concepts more clear. And these are really worth getting precise. So one is you'll hear people talk about polls or plays or trials. And this is just one opportunity you have to try out one of your ideas. So if, for instance, you're on a website and you're using Locals 1 and 2, this might be some new incoming user. Each one of them will be treated as a play. 
and you get to assign them to one of the arms. You get to say they see logo one, or they get to see logo two. And which one of these that they get to see is the arm we use, and the period where we get this opportunity is called a play. After that happens, after every single play, we're going to assume that something happens. And this is one of the assumptions of the traditional multi-arm band literature that's slightly problematic in the web context. And I'll talk more about that later. But for now, we'll sort of shrug that issue aside and just think about how these algorithms work if you have instantaneous feedback. And certainly from many types of click through rate analysis, this actually does work, which is you imagine that you pull an arm, you send one of these people to one of the logos or the other one, and then you get to measure some success. And your success in the click through rate will just be did they click on something or not. And so that measure of success will be called a reward. And the notion is we have this reward measure, and it is the thing we want to optimize. It's the thing we're trying to make as big as possible. And so this becomes sort of classical problem of maximizing rewards. And that's really the notion we want to get at, which is assume you have some useful thing like crypto rates you're trying to make as large as possible. How can we do that? What is the mechanism for maximizing reward? And we want to do it progressively over every single poll and every single play. So let's get started and think about how we could actually do that with real algorithms. So we'll move on to the next slide and see one example of how we can think about it. And the way we need to think about it first is to make sure we have two concepts very clear in our heads. And these two concepts, I think, are sufficiently tricky that they often stumble, make people sort of stumble on them. There are concepts of being the objectively best option and the subjectively best option. And options here are the same thing as arms. So the logos you might be using, your web design, the types of login pages, da 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 da. And the objectively best one is the thing you're actually trying to find. It's the reason you're doing testing at all. So because you know that somewhere there is a best logo. You're not sure which one it is, but you know it exists. And in the future, if you were using it, it would give you the most reward. It would give you the most click-through rates. It would give you the most conversions. Whatever you're trying to maximize, the objectively best option is the one you want to be doing. The problem, though, is that you don't know that. You only know what's subjectively best. And this is what you get from you looking at the past and seeing what you've seen when you've actually previously tried different arms. Some of them go really, really well. Some of them did not go really, really well. But the analysis is always backward looking. You think about what you know, what you subjectively believe about the world, and you try to guess at things. And the goal is to try to bring what you think is subjectively best progressively more and more towards what is objectively best. And this terminology is really helpful for talking about the first algorithm, which we'll have on the next slide, which is the epsilon greedy algorithm. In order to present this algorithm, which is on this slide here, we want to rethink about how A-B tests work first. Because if we think about them even for a little bit, we can immediately come up with a new algorithm that is our first multi arm brain algorithm. And the reason I really hammer this, home, this point home is that this algorithm, which we'll talk about, is called the epsilon greedy algorithm, includes as it an A-B testing scenario already. So A-B testing is just one form of this epsilon greedy system. And that's really why this framework for thinking about tests is so powerful is all of the ideas you're used to for thinking about, they're already in this new framework. And so how does a traditional A-B test work? Well, when you're before the A-B testing period and you're after the A-B testing period, you assign 100% of the users to what you subjectively think is best. And what you subjectively think is best is based on some historical data you have. And this is what all the graphs we had looked like. You got a bunch of data, and then based on the data you got, you kept assigning people uniformly 100% of the time to whichever one seemed best to you. And then there was a different point, which is the actual A-B testing period. So during A-B testing, what you did was you assigned 100% users to a completely randomly chosen option. So here you went from always trying to do what subjectively seemed best to completely randomly assigning people so you could set up a nice clean experiment and see what data you could get. And then afterwards, you're going to switch and only use the subjectively best option. And you can think about this in being, well, like, hmm, there are two ideas here. One of them is what we would often call exploitation, which is using the subjectively best option. Sometimes people even call this the greedy selection rule. And then another idea is this idea of exploration, of trying out new things. And you do that by just randomly searching through the options you have available to you. And yeah, the traditional A-B testing period works is that before and after, you always exploit the best option. 
And during A-B testing, you always, 100% of the time, explore from all the options available to you. And this is really where you get to think about, well, maybe we could do something a little smoother. If we do something smoother, maybe we can have the system gradually turn itself off. And so what we're going to do is go on to the next slide and see an algorithm that actually does exactly that. And it's a very simple thing. On this next slide here is that we have an algorithm which, instead of doing the 100% random search through things, instead does that only for 100% minus X. And so you could say X is 10% of the people. And so 90% of the time, what you're going to do is actually not at all like the traditional A-B test. 90% of the time, what you're going to do is like the pre- and post-testing period. 90% of the time, you're going to send people to the subjectively best option. But X percent of the time during your testing period, you're going to send people to a completely randomly chosen option. So here you've introduced this testing idea, this exploration idea, but you've done it in a mechanism in which it's not completely uniform. It's not that during the test, always you try to explore and you try to see out new options by randomly selecting options. And it's not that you're doing that you know, before and after the opposite. Instead, what you're doing is before and after, you're always greedily selecting what seems best. You're always doing what subjectively seems best. But during the testing period, you're going to do a mixture of the two of these. And the mixture is really what defines it, because you can set this mixture in such a way that you've never done any testing. And that happens if you set x to 0. If x is 0, you've never done any testing. And if x is 100%, this is the traditional A-B test you know about. And so the notion is that maybe you want to set x to somewhere in between those two extremes. Maybe that's really what's best for you. And not only that, if you read the book, you'll see that one of the things you can try to do is progressively, slowly make x slightly lower. And so you start with sending lots of people to randomly chosen options during your testing period and progressively turn that off over time. And that is a kind of strategy to talk to that in, sometimes is called annealing, and it's a really valuable thing. But even more valuable than that concept is just the mere concept of having this be continuous. You can gradedly move from totally not doing any testing to totally doing extreme testing where you're always randomly assigning people. So this is really a great strategy. This is what people call the epsilon greedy algorithm. And it turns out that in many, many, many cases, you can't really do better than this. It's hard to figure out what the best epsilon is, and there are many ways you might think about trying to test it, and the book goes into quite a lot of detail about thinking about those ideas. But in practice, this algorithm is already a great one. And it gives you just a framework of thinking about A-B testing, which is think of it as one special type of epsilon greedy testing. And really the question is, are those special types privileged, or is a different value of x in this rule slightly better than the ones you're usually using? And if you go online, there's a link that I've asked you know, it's to send out to people. And if you see that, you'll actually find that there are <clears throat> code for all of these algorithms there. And the epsilon greedy one is very, very simple. It's just a few lines. So that's really the core of the simplest algorithm for thinking about exploration and exploitation, for thinking about how you could do better tests on the web simply. So let's move on to the next slide and think about a little bit more about what else we could try to do. And so when we think about what else we could try to do, one of the things we could think about is what have we been doing wrong? And so one of the things we might be doing wrong is that we're actually totally ignoring the difference in the options available to us. And that's really the fatal flaw in many ways of the epsilon greedy algorithm, is that it's just totally indifferent to whether the fact that some of the options are really good and some of them are really bad. And the way you can think about that is thinking about two possible situations. In situation one, we have a click-through rate for the first option that's 99%. And obviously no real situation is like this, but just imagine it. And option two, in contrast, has a click-through rate that thousands of times worse, you know, enormously, enormously worse. And in situation two, in contrast, the two, arm, two options you have, the two arms you have, are actually much more similar. One of them has a click-through rate of 2%, and one of them has a click-through rate of 1%. And the question really becomes is, do we treat these things as the same, or do we treat them as very different? And they're really not the same in some deep sense, but the epsilon greedy algorithm actually will treat them exactly the same. What it will do is that once it starts to figure out that option one in both of these settings is the best, most of the time it will go with option one. 
and sum of the time, which is the epsilon part or the x part on the previous slide, it will go with the inferior one. And it does that whether or not the inferior one is just a little inferior or whether it's radically inferior. And this is sort of a, a fatal flaw in some settings. And this is one of the things you might want to try to get around. So that's the first thing we might try to improve on with the epsilon degree algorithm. So the next slide is going to present you with a different algorithm. And this different algorithm is called the softmax algorithm. And it gets around the problems with the epsilon degree algorithm. Now, it doesn't always get around all of them. It can sometimes be worse. But it's worth understanding about to think about why you might try it. And so the here, the strategy is going to be exactly to try to deal with what I just described, which is you would like to explore the different options available to you. You'd like to test them in proportion somehow to their previous performance, to how subjectively good they seem to you to be. And one way to think about it is to imagine option one having a cookie rate of 0.02% and option two having one of 0.01%. And so here, option one is twice as good as option two. Um, and this actually is slightly broken on the slide, unfortunately. My apologies for that. I wrote option two twice as often as option one. What it should say is option one twice as often as option two. So mentally reverse that, and I'll say that a couple of times to make sure that's clear. What strategy here is going to be that if option one is twice as good as option two, you would like to be assigning your users twice as often to it. So if there are only two of these cases and you want to do it to be twice as often, you would say that two-thirds of the people who come into the website now should go to option one. In contrast, only one-third should go to option two. And this is really the crux of the difference between the previous algorithm we talked about and this new softmax algorithm. In the previous one, what we would have done is say, no matter what the differences were between these two options, um, we are going to consistently, consistently only send a small subset of our people to something that's not the best one. In contrast, here, the softmax algorithm, what we're going to do is we're going to try to assign people twice as often to the thing that seems best to us. And we would gradually adjust this over time depending on how different they were. So if you go back to that hypothetical scenario that was really extreme, really exaggerated, and we brought about earlier, a really exaggerated example was one in which the first option was 99.99% .99 good, and the other one was 0.0001%. And so there, what you would try to do is you would try to use the sign people to the first option, which is 99% option, a thousand times more often than the second one. And this is really the crux of the softmax algorithm, is this notion of trying to do things in proportion to how good they are. And you really, this is a big game in many scenarios where things are actually noticeably different from the traditional epsilon degree algorithm we just described. So this is one of the things you want to think about if you're going to try to move on and try to do some different types of testing. So let's move on and think about what could go wrong with even this strategy. It's a great strategy. And then you see if you look through the code in the book, you'll see that very often the softmax rule is extremely effective. Well, there is one thing wrong with it. And this is the last of the algorithms we're going to talk about during the subcast. In this last algorithm, we'll try to solve the following weakness of the softmax algorithm, which is that it totally ignores how much we actually know about the performance of each of the options. And so the way to think about this is two situations again. In situation one, option one has the same click-through rate of 2%, and option two has the click-through rate of 1% that we saw on previous slides. In situation two, we can also have the same types of click-through rates. The differences between these situations are going to be how much we know about the world, how much experience we have historically, and how certain we can be of, of those click-through rates. So imagine in situation one that you have click-through rates of 2% and 1%. They've only had 100 trials. You've had 100 users come in, and you've assigned them to the, either option one or option two, and you've seen these click-through rates. Well, if you've only had 100 trials, and the click-through rates are 2% and 1%, this is actually the difference between the two options is one click. Really, you don't really want to invest very much in one click difference. In contrast, in situation two, you're seeing a difference of 2% and 1% after a million trials. And this is a big difference. This is a thousand times more information. And so here, you should be much more confident that option one is better than option two. So one of the weaknesses you might try to resolve from both the epsilon greedy algorithm and the softmax algorithm is this notion of trying to think about how much you know. How can you make sure that you would explore option one more than option two very frequently in this case? 
And the next algorithm on the next slide is exactly one strategy for trying to deal with it. And so this algorithm in rough form is presented here, and it's called the UCB1 algorithm. And the exact details are presented in the book, and you can also just find the code. And that's a very simple equation, but it has a little sort of a little a little tediousness about it. We have to define some terms and square roots and logs, which is why I thought it wasn't so helpful to have on the slide. The intuition is really what matters about it, which is you want to explore things that are unfamiliar. And this is in some sense the whole reason of doing testing in the first place. You always wanted to try out things you weren't sure might have been better than what you knew about already. And so what you would think about is imagine you have option one. It's been played two times in the past. And option two has been played eight times. So you know a lot more about option two than option one. And so the strategy here is going to be try to figure out some balance, which is you're going to explore option one unless option two is much better. And the definition really comes to how do you define much better? And much better is going to turn out it's going to be just a function. And you can see in the code online what exactly this function is, but it's some rule that says, you know, if this thing has been explored eight times and the one has been explored two times, then the, then the difference between them that makes me willing to try out option one is that option two must not be more than, say, 0.1 click through rate percent better than the other one. And the exact details of this algorithm are online. They're a little technical, as I mentioned, um, and they're certainly not intuitive if you don't go through the derivation in some detail. But the real intuition is exactly what's being presented here, which is you just want to make some rule which says, unless option one is much inferior to option two, and you can make that precise, you want to try it out precisely because you know less about it. And so that's the crux of the UCV1 algorithm. And in many ways, these three algorithms encompass the core things you might want to think about when designing a testing system of any sort. So these testing systems need to deal with three problems. One of them is this notion of just trying to not do completely the standard A-B testing of do no testing at all, suddenly do 50-50 testing between two options, or you know, one-third, one-third, one-third between three, et cetera that strategy and then going back to be totally greedy and subjectively choosing always the subjectively best option, always trying to take the thing that seems best and has the highest click through rates. So you want to do is try to have some way of mixing those periods. The first algorithm we discussed, the epsilon greedy algorithm, tries to solve that in one simple way. And the way it tries to solve it is to just have most of the time you're going to select what seems best to you. Most of the time you're going to do that except for X percent of the time or epsilon percent of the time. And this little difference actually makes a big, big change because it means that rather than having two extremes, the pre- and post-testing period and the mid-testing period, what the two extremes are going to be now are the boundaries of something you can sort of continuously, gradually move between. The second algorithm, the softmax algorithm, was one in which we try to deal with Think about what are the relative qualities of the things I have. Is the L logo one twice as good as logo two or not? And the third one says, how much do I actually know about what I'm doing? If I don't know, I should really try them out quite a lot. But once I start to know a lot about them, I shouldn't do it as much. And in fact, the UCB at one algorithm has a real virtue there that we didn't really get a chance to talk about much here, but is it is in many ways the way to think about the stopping problem that people usually have with A-B tests, which is, I started running the tests, that's great, but when do I turn them off? And the UCB1 algorithm and a family of other related algorithms that are all called UCB algorithms, all of them think very cleanly and very precisely about exactly when you should start to stop. And one of the things that's really fascinating about the way they think about that is that they actually never really stop. They always have this notion that every once in a while, you do need to go back and try out things that you didn't know as much about anymore. And this is actually a very big difference in traditional A-B testing, and this notion of continual testing, of having them on all the time. And I think that's really the way to think about them relative to A-B testing. So if we move on to the next slide, we try to think about these new tests we talked about relative to the old A-B tests. And the reason I title this slide is because there was a blog post that circulated around a lot of people because it was on Hacker News at one point during last summer, which was, will MAB tests beat AB tests every time? And the claim of the blog post was, yes, they'll always beat it. And my response would be, well, maybe. You shouldn't be so sure, but it's a way to think about what tests you want to run. 
And so the reason I say you shouldn't think that it's always going to be it is A-B testing is a type of multi-arm banded testing. So it doesn't really make sense to say that one is going to always beat the other one because really they're sort of both the same thing in some sense. But MAV tests can be more flexible. The three algorithms we've had give you, even within multi-arm banded algorithms, three possible ways to think about testing. And each of them themselves are quite flexible. One of the virtues of them, and this is really the thing that's most important in some sense, is that they know how to turn themselves off automatically. And the UCB1 algorithm is arguably the best at doing this, but you can set up the epsilon greedy on the softmax algorithms in this as well. They'll progressively figure out what is best, and they'll start to use only that. But they'll do it very gradually, very smoothly, and therefore they can actually improve incrementally. And this is where you see, if you're going to see a big gain from using multi ion band testing relative to A-B test, it's all going to be there. But that said, your mileage may vary. And that really needs to be clear to people. If you're going to start doing this testing, you need to test and maybe test it. And in general, you should be testing these things, period. And most of the people I know who do a lot of testing are quite familiar with this. They realize that things are really subtle and can go very wrong. But I'd really like to re-articulate that point again to people, which is, before you start actually trying to run these tests, make sure you've thought a lot about how testing works. And so one of the ways you can do this, and this is a strategy that some people at Microsoft call AA testing. And I think this is a great idea. I think this is something everyone absolutely wants to try to do. And AA testing is a very simple idea, which is set up the entire strategy you use to do A-B testing or multi arm banded testing. Set up that infrastructure, the code base, everything, then run a test, but the test is going to just assign 50% of people to group A. And it's going to assign another 50% of people to also group A. But you're going to keep track of them. So they get the same user experience, but you're going to call them two different groups. You're going to treat them as if they were different, but in reality their experiences are always the experiences you really would call group A's experience. And now think about how different are the, how different are the clicks-through rates you get from those two groups. Is group A1 and group A2 different? Are they really different? Are they significantly different? Do your tests tend to choose one of the groups versus the other one? If any of those things say yes, if you find real differences between them, it suggests that you need to be very careful about how you're doing the testing. In my experience and the experience of many people who work on this, you do see that. Often you'll find that there are illusory differences that creep up and that the AA test suggests that one of the two A's is better. And that's a real sign that something is not going right. And every time you see that sign, you should think, well, I should be cautious about the whole business of A-B testing and A B testing. I need to be very careful to make sure I get it right. If I get it right, I can do really great stuff. But if I'm not, I shouldn't be quick to fixate on saying, oh, this algorithm will solve all of my problems. And one way to try to build up an intuition for this, and this is a major part of what the book tries to get across, is the idea of doing Monte Carlo simulations which is thinking about these algorithms as very simple rules for deciding things and now set up very simple scenarios on your computer and simulate them. And if you don't know this term Monte Carlo, it's something that originated during World War II. And it's actually the reason we have computers in the first place, which is people were thinking, well, I have these scenarios. I want to explore them. I want to see what would happen if I tried out things and let them play out but I have no real way of knowing because I can't do simple math to figure it out. So I just need to try them. I need to simulate them. And I like to set up a computer to do them. And basically what happens is the computer will use a random number generator and generate many small differences on the same scenario. And you get to see every time you do these small differences, how does the algorithm work out? And I think this is really important for building an intuition for the three algorithms I've presented, but also from traditional A-B testing, which is you want to make sure that you understand how they work in simulation. If you know exactly that I know I configured option one to be better than option two, I set up two logos and I know that logo one because I instrumented the click-through rates for it to be twice as high as the, uh, the click-through rates for logo two, what's going to happen? Is my algorithm going to say that that's best? Is it going to select it or is it going to wander? Or in the worst case scenario, the nightmare scenario we talked about earlier, is it going to slowly start to settle on the inferior option? I want to find some way of knowing these things. And the best way to know them is not to just blindly deploy them on a live site and ruin your user experience. They're to try them offline on a simple simulation based on reasonable stuff you know about your own website. You know your own click-through rates historically. 
You know the types of ideas you're exploring. You know how different the logos you might be exploring, how different the landing pages you might be exploring. Try out some reasonable hypotheses, and before you actually put anything live, get a sense of what's going to happen. And this is really, really important for things like the Epsilon Greedy algorithm we mentioned because they have a parameter, Epsilon, that you can actually tune to get different experiences. And you really want to figure out, well, what is the right tuning? Or at least, what is the best starting range for the tuning, even if you can't get the exact right value? So these things are really important to do, and that's why I really strongly encourage people to try simulations. And so that's really sort of almost the ending point. The last thing I'd like to say on this next slide are the sort of two main sort of topics you really want to think about about scaling multi-on band requests. And so one of them really comes down to can you afford to do these additional computations of just you know, flipping coins every time to decide where people wind up? This is sort of a trivial thing if you're doing A-B testing, but it's worth thinking about if you have to be serving so many people at a very high rate. And it's particularly problematic if you start to do things like the softmax rule we talked about, or you start to use the UCB1 algorithm, because those involve actual real math. They involve things like square roots and logs, which are certainly extremely fast, they're not necessarily so fast that you can afford to be passing information back and forth for every single user on a site, say, the size of Facebook. One of the ways you might try to deal with this, and this seems to be the way that Google's strategy has been based on the information they publish, is that you might want to try caching the assignments of the arms. So traditional A-B testing can do this very easily. It says there's A and B, and I'm just going to say the rule, which is you know, user 1 and user 3 and user 7 and user 9 go to A, and two, four, da 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 da, will go to B. And you can just define those things in advance. And that's very easy for A-B testing. The reality is they're actually not much different from doing multi-on band testing. It's just that you want to be able to update those caches pretty frequently. And so one way you might try to do this is just can you afford to do the assignment updates once a day? And if you think you can have a computational system that will go pass through all your historical data once a day and generate new assignments, you can definitely make these kind of tests scale. They're a little difficult because the theory doesn't necessarily apply there. But if you do some simulations, you'll often see that they do still work. But these sorts of strategies are totally viable. And that's really the question I want to end on is, is this thing going to work for you? Are you going to be able to scale it? And will these strategies work? So if we go on to the next slide, I'm going to give you some additional resources where hopefully you can go and learn more about these things and see whether they'll work for you. And so on here, this next position, you see is the link for the book and also for the GitHub code repeat repository that has all information. And so obviously I, I would prefer that you buy her book. It's very cheap. It's the deal of the day for $8. And you can read a lot about these algorithms, see how they work, and try to get more of an intuition for what's going on. And also a big part of the book is going into detail about how to do clean simulations, right? The GitHub repository, in contrast, is just the code. It doesn't give you any sort of instruction about how things work, but it is usable code. It's very simple code, but there are people who've been building code based on it since then that's much more scalable. But the idea there is to just give you an intuition, to immediately let you play around, and to let you see what's going to happen when you run different algorithms. That actual website, the GitHub repo, has several different algorithms not described in the book. Um, and they've also got code that community people have donated because they've read the book or they looked through the code base and they were really inspired. And so there's links there to code in Ruby and in Python and Julia. Um, and there's also information on how to get code in JavaScript. And I think someone even has code in Clojure. And for all I know, there's code in Haskell at this point. Now, a lot of people have built up a lot of code bases for exploring these algorithms. And I highly encourage people to try them out and go there. And if you have any algorithms you want to contribute, please give us them. Um, and if you just really want to explore these things, you know, you can always go grab that code. Um, so that really is the end of the main things I wanted to discuss today. So let's turn it over now to Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, John. And folks, we want to let you know that the GitHub um, URL that John has on the screen for you there, we have pushed that out to you in your group chat, so you can access that right away. Okay, we'll take some questions in the order they have come in. And folks, we are at Q&A, so if you don't have that group chat open, open it up, type in your question for John, send it in, and he'll answer um, it for you. Okay, we have a question from Daniel. And Daniel asks, why are you using generic aggregate click-through rates to determine success. Shouldn't there be some accountability for the traffic results, like A um, caused X click-through and B caused Y click-through? 
Um, uh, I'm trying to make sure I make full sense of this question. So the, the question is that A causes X click-through, click-through like click-through to a different type of site, I'm assuming, um, or uh, presumably what we've already been discussing, which is X percent click-through. Um, and I've sort of you know, been presenting this highly generic thing because it's very simple and easy to analyze, and it's the tradition people would use. Um, if what you're thinking about is that A causes people to click through to a different option, and so, you know, say, suppose I show them this logo and it makes them likely to buy this book on, a, you know, Amazon, and I show them this logo and it makes them likely to buy that book. Um, in that case, you really are well beyond the range of traditional testing algorithms. You're sort of well beyond what sort of traditional A-B testing was really meant to be doing, um, and, and well, well beyond what traditional multi iron banded algorithms were meant to do. Um, they're very closely linked to a set of algorithms called reinforcement learning algorithms that would let you deal with that kind of scenario. Um, but if you're trying to really drill down on complicated causal questions, I'm not sure that this kind of testing framework is the best strategy. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's really an interesting very question. Um, and it's certainly very important to many people, but it's, it's not trivial to answer them using the sort of simple automated algorithms we're talking about. Um, you can start to make progress, but it's you know, really answering sort of complicated causal questions like this logo causes this and this logo causes that, and I therefore, depending on the current settings, can change what its logos I'm displaying to cause people to do different things. That's a really powerful thing to do, but it's often am more ambitious than you can hope for. I mean, I guess especially to me, I would be very cautious about it because many people have the experience that basic testing things is actually very, very difficult that often by the time you figured out which of two logos has the higher click-through rate, totally generically, that information has already expired. Um, and so, you know, if you can't really achieve even sort of simpler things like figuring out which of the two logos has higher Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have John Miles White presenting Bandit Algorithms for the Web. John is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, Bandit Algorithms for Website Optimization. John is also the author of the best selling O'Reilly books. Machine Learning for Hackers, and Machine Learning for Email. We're really excited to have John with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you folks get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for John. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for John, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is VelocityConf, all one word. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. 
for choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast, and we'll have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to John for his presentation. Hello, John. Hi, Yasmina. Thanks for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Hopefully, we'll enjoy the webcast. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this material, so I think it'll be really interesting to talk about. Um, so basically, what I want to talk about is the idea of using multi armed gain algorithms to try to optimize websites. Uh, and my sort of spiel for this is going to be thinking about it in terms of transitioning from something that many people do know about, which is A-B tests, and thinking about them as using a different approach, which I'll call M-A-B tests for multi-armed bandits. Um, and I think this is sort of a really fascinating approach because in many ways, band algorithms are actually very simple algorithms, and we'll talk about them a lot through the rest of this webcast. And it tends to, if you actually rat, sit down and write the code, the code is extremely brief. And to make them sort of high scalable and things like that is sophisticated and takes some work, but just writing down the basic algorithm is usually never more than 10 lines of code. What's actually sort of subtle about these, and it's very different from other types of algorithms, is sort of understanding the applicability, understanding how they're going to work, especially relative to traditional A-B testing. And one of the reasons we're going to emphasize that is because, in fact, A-B testing can be thought of as a type of multi-armed beta testing. So MAB testing, in some sense, is just a strict superset of AB testing. And so let's get started. So you know, the main question we all have to think about is the question of answering, how do we build better websites? Um, sorry, everyone. It seems like my uh, slide deck is slightly frozen. Um, there we go. Now it worked. All right. And so the question, as I was saying, is that we want to ask, how do we build better websites? And you know, growing up in New York, the sort of obvious thing that you think about is that it's like trying to get to Carnegie Hall. The way that you build a better website is that you just do testing and testing and testing and testing. And you know, that is sort of um, sorry. Oh, sorry, everyone. I can see that Yasmia is actually offering to advance the slides from this since it seems not to work. So please go ahead next. Um, as I said, testing, testing, testing. So next, so how do we build better tests in some sense? That's really what we want to think about. But before we get there, we want to ask ourselves, why is it that we run tests? What is the reason that A-B testing became so popular, and why is it that people might hope to move on and try to use multi-armed bandit testing as a way to try to do slightly better than the A-B tests that are already running? Well, the reason we run tests in the first place is because we have lots of ideas. If we're at all creative, we can think of many different possible ways we could set up our website. And we can think about things like how do we run our email campaigns, how do we decide which logos we choose, how do we decide which type of landing page we have, do we people have do people sign in this way first? Da -da 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 -da. There's many possible things we could think about. And we also have the idea that some of these ideas are better than others. And the question really becomes is how do we figure out which ones are better than the others? So if we go on to the next slide, we have to think about this question, which is what happened if we had one standard logo? And for this example, I'll use the O'Reilly logo. And think about, is this the best logo, or could we do better if we moved on to the next slide and thought about what could possibly a different logo look like? And this is sort of a joke on the next slide, but you know, imagine having 2.0 added in. Everyone likes 2.0, and well, you know, it's a little small, so it doesn't make much of a difference. But maybe sort of subliminally, it will make O'Reilly seem even better than it already is. And so the question is, how could we tell? Is this new logo better than the old logo, or is it actually much worse than the old logo? And my guess is that it's so small and such a subtle difference, it's probably not much of an importance. But we still would like to be able to sort of precisely measure the difference between these two types of things. If we move on to the next slide, we're going to start to talk about how we would do that. And the classical way we do this is with an A-B test. And I hope that this slide in some sense sort of subsumes what we vision as what an A-B test is and what we're hoping its success will be. And so this is a little sort of simple schematic graph. On the x-axis moving across, we have time. And so we're thinking about things where before we start A-B testing, what happens while we're doing A-B testing, and at the end, what happens after we're done with A-B testing. And we're testing two logos, logo one and logo two. And on the y-axis is CTR, the click-through rate. 
And this is for many types of things, the thing we would like to optimize on the website. So obviously there are other metrics one would like to optimize, but let's just start with this to have something simple and numeric. And for the rest of the algorithms we're going to talk about during this webcast, it's really important. Having things that are numeric makes the algorithms very precise and easy to state. In practice, this is a subtle point, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you do want to make sure that those numbers you choose and things like click rate are really what you want to optimize. Because it's always possible to make those numbers really large, but you're inflating them at the expense of other things you might care about. All of that said, this is usually how people view A-B testing. We have a period before A-B testing where we have our first logo, logo one. And then we enter an A-B testing period. And what happens here is that half of the people that we see get assigned to group A. And group A sees logo one. And half of the people we see get assigned to logo two. And they are in group B. And the result of that is that there's a click-through rate associated with logo one, which we can see in sort of very dark greenish line. And then the lighter greenish line is the click-through rate associated with logo two. And so during the A-B test period, what we get is the average of these two click-through rates, the 50-50 mix of having half of the people in group A see logo one and half of the people in group B see logo two. And this is really what we imagine most of the testing is like. We start testing something, it's a new idea, and it's better than we already have. And so we start seeing a comparison between the two groups for a while until we realize, and that's when we end the A-B test, that we've actually decided logo two is the better logo. At that point, we move on, and we can see that the post-A-B testing click-through rate is reliably higher than the pre-A-B testing click-through rate. And along the way, we have a little period of exploration. And during that period of exploration, we were still doing better than our pre-A-B test. And so this is really the dream. This is what everyone hopes for when they run a web test. They start with some ideas that they traditionally had. They come up with some new idea. And they put it into tests. And those tests are always at least as good as what they used to be, and sometimes they're better. And that's because the new idea is really a better idea. Eventually, they realize that the better idea is the new one, and they fixate on it and remove the old idea. And so everything is better progressively across time. This is the ideal of A-B testing. But when we move on to the next slide, we'll see that this is not always what happens. And so the one possibility is that you run a test. In this schematic, what we see is there are two logos again. But now logo two, the new idea, is actually inferior to the first one. And so what happens is that before A-B testing, we have a pretty high click-through rate associated with logo one. Then during A-B testing, we have a 50-50 mix. Some people are seeing the old good idea, and some people are seeing the new bad idea. And so we drop, and that's what the brown line is, is the drop from mixing in some new inferior idea with our old traditional way of doing things. This is certainly not something we really want to wind up in. But eventually we realize that this was a mistake. Our new idea wasn't actually good, and we go back and revert everything to the way it was before. And so you see that in this graph. The post-AV testing period is one in which we have exactly the same performance as the pre-AV testing period. And this is obviously a thing we all worry about when we run tests. But of course, you have to run tests to decide whether we're in the first setting we saw before where things will get better, or in this setting where things are going to stay the same. If you take no risks, you'll never learn anything new. And in many ways, the idea of trying to do good tests is learning when to take risks and how to stop them and how to make sure that you're getting the most out of them. This is 